Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you this day, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jeff, that was a wonderful statement you gave, and you basically stole my thunder, so I'm done. <laughs> that, was, that was wonderful. The reference to my sermon text today may be somewhat premature, but then again, maybe not. Regardless, here goes. In a few months from now, we will all be celebrating the Christmas season. The mad rush to the malls or the big box stores at 4, 5, or 6 in the morning to get the best deals will begin in full force. Laura and I did this once, never again. The Christmas music will be played on the airwaves, sometimes even before Thanksgiving, which to me is way too early. Then the Christmas music movies will begin to be shown on TV. Movies like A Christmas Carol, which has several versions. The Miracle on 34th Street, the original is the best. The Bishop's Wife, the original one with Cary Grant, one of my favorite actors. Holiday Affair with Robert Mitchum and, Lee, and Vivian Lee, And then the granddaddy of them all, It's a Wonderful Life, with Jimmy Stewart, Donna Reed, and an all-star supporting cast. This movie depicts the main character, George Bailey, being shown by Clarence the Angel, what life would have been like for his family and friends had George not been born. This movie is so well liked, it is shown twice during the Christmas season on a national network and is always shown on Christmas Eve. Approximately six months ago, I heard about this book on WCRF and decided to purchase it and read it. I was intrigued by the title, 52 Little Lessons from It's a Wonderful Life. I thought, what lessons are there to be learned from this movie? I had always watched the movie from an entertainment viewpoint, not a life lessons viewpoint. So I thought, why not? Let's see what the author has to say. In retrospect, I learned the basic lesson. Don't judge a book by its cover. The 52 lessons are excerpts from the movie that portray the scenes incorporating a Christian theme. After you read and relate the scene with the author's reference to Christian living, you have one of those aha moments and say, yes, I can see that. The 52 lessons are lessons that you can apply one per week relative to your Christian walk with God. In lieu of examining several lessons, I have selected a theme that I feel is prevalent throughout the movie. And that theme is the concept of giving oneself for the betterment of others. 2 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8 states, Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. I think the character George Bailey is the personification of these verses. He relinquishes his time, his talents, and his financial resources to help others. Let's examine an example of each. Time. George's desire is to leave Bedford Falls. I'm going to see the world, Italy, Greece, the Parthenon, the Colosseum. Then I'm coming back here and go to college and see what they know. Then I'm going to build things. Little did he know that God had other plans for him. God wants him right where he is, Bedford Falls. George isn't going anywhere. God's plan for George is to remain in Bedford Falls and continue to run the family building and loan business and continue to make it more of a successful venture than it already is. The citizens of Bedford Falls need George and the building and loan, and as we discover, George needs those same people. Have you ever felt the need to move on, to do something different, maybe a different job, but you just could not make the connection? In retrospect, maybe God has placed you where he needs you to be, where you can serve him in the best possible manner. The Jewish philosopher Martin Buber said, every journey has a secret destination of which the traveler is unaware. Trust and have faith in Jesus as you take this journey together. He will lead you where you need to be. Allow Jesus to guide your footsteps on the path of life. Stay focused and tune into God's frequency. Take the time to know God. Read his word 
have a conversation with God through prayer. Open your heart, soul, and mind to God and discover the fullness of God's love and grace. Time is a fixed entity. You really don't have all the time in the world. As you are able, share with others that desire your help or presence. To you, your time may be precious, but to the ones with whom you share it, it can be priceless. Talent. Running the family business is not an easy job. There are loan applications to review and process, bank records to maintain, collection of payments, employee issues, issues which fortunately for George he did not have to address since he had his uncle and several other uh, trusted employees. George had a good business sense about him and a knack for maintaining and growing the business. This talent is evidenced by the fact that he is a trustworthy businessman who is concerned for his client's best interests. He looks at more than the bottom line in the client's bank account when applying for a loan. He examines the heart and shows the willingness to work with the client to achieve the client's goal. He's in the client's corner, so to speak, just as God is in ours. Allow God to disclose to you your talents. We all have talents of the Spirit given to us by God. Several of those talents are service, teaching, giving, leadership, administration. Discover your gift or gifts of the Spirit and use them to help others and continue God's kingdom here on earth. Whatever gift or talent you may have, channel it into an opportunity to glorify God. God will bless you for your actions. Financial. Money is the sore spot of any discussion. We work hard for our money and we don't like to lose it or frivolously give it away. We can make it work for us and allow us to live comfortably. George and Mary had received quite a bundle as a wedding gift and are on their way to New York to celebrate their honeymoon. George is finally getting out of Bedford Falls. Suddenly, the stock market crashes, and there was a subsequent run on the banks as people clamored to withdraw their savings. George's building and loan business is not an exception. His clients want their money now. However, as we know, that money is invested and is not on hand in large amounts. What is George to do? How is he going to keep the business from the creditors, yet satisfy his clients? His new wife, Mary, has the answer. They'll use their own wedding money to give to their customers in order to maintain the solvency of the business and stave off bankruptcy. George and Mary could have gone to New York and had their honeymoon in luxury, and if the business faltered, so what? There would be other opportunities, and possibly out of Bedford Falls. But George didn't hesitate to be there for his friends. He isn't going to run out on them. He would see this thing through with them and help them where he could. And if it took his own money to do it, so be it. Where are you in this equation? God only asked for 10%. We can keep the remaining 90% and use it as judiciously as we see fit. Are we generous with our finances? Do we donate to a cause or a program in which we have an interest? Right here at Fields, one can donate their own time, talents, and finances to the uh, various programs that are part of this church. Examples would be the Tuesday night suppers. Be a server, help cook, or donate to the purchase of the food. Or maybe you have an interest in teaching a class. Use your time and talent in this endeavor. Outside the church, become involved with the community. Volunteer at a hospital or the food center or your local library. Serve as Jesus served. Give as Jesus gave. George Bailey did, and he was blessed beyond all expectations you want to know how? Well, at the end, he... Nah, sorry. You have to watch the movie to see how God richly blessed him. In 1944, an American B-52 bomber was returning to base after a bombing run over Germany. It had been badly damaged, and several of its crew had been killed. As the American pilot was trying to maintain control of the plane, he noticed a German fighter pilot had pulled up even to him and the two pilots exchanged glances. The American pilot's glance was one of fear and trepidation, for he knew his disabled plane was fair game for the German pilot. The German pilot's demeanor was one of calmness, and he simply nodded to the American pilot. 
At the time, the American pilot did not know that the German pilot needed one more kill to be classified as an ace, that his brother, also a German pilot, had been killed two days earlier. The German pilot escorted the Bailey damaged B-52 as far across the North Atlantic as he could, and when he reached a certain area, he pulled up and away and headed back to Germany. The American pilot could not believe his luck. Was it really luck, or had God intervened? Permit me to finish the story, then you decide. For years, both men had a lingering question. The American pilot wondered why his counterpart had spared him, and the German pilot wondered if the badly damaged B-52 had made it safely back to its base. Finally, after 50 years had passed, the American pilot decided to reach out and try to, to reach his enemy to see if he was still alive. He contacted a German association of former fighter pilots and relayed his story. To his amazement, a former pilot responded to his correspondence, as he too had often wondered if his comrade in arms had made it safely back to the base and survived the war. Over time, they exchanged letters. Then a friendship began to blossom between the two men. They then decided to meet. What a glorious occasion it was for each man. They shared their memories of their experiences during the war, discussed, discussed their present lives, and became good friends, as did their wives. They vacationed together and enjoyed each other's company. Several years after their initial meeting, and with his health failing, the American pilot invited the German pilot to a family function. When they arrived at the hall, the pilot introduced him to his children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, then took him aside and told him that without your kindness, to allow me to live, the people you see in this hall, my family, would not have been here. The German pilot was overcome with emotion and had to leave the hall. He later disclosed that if he had not been aware of his brother's death two days prior to their encounter, he would have fired on the disabled B-52, sending the pilot and the remaining crew to their deaths. But Germany was losing the war, and he had seen too much death and destruction he decided to escort the damaged B-52 as far as he could so no other German fighter planes would attempt to attack it. For to him, it was time to save lives, not take them. Think about this. Maybe the American pilot could be looked upon as a real-life George Bailey. For without his life being spared by the German pilot, there would have been no family for the American pilot to raise and nurture and guide through life's pathways. Just like if George Bailey had not been born, he would have not been around to save his brother when Harry fell through the ice. Harry would have drowned. Or as a young boy, George would not have been there to warn the pharmacist, Mr. Gower, who was visibly, visibly upset upon learning of his own son's death in the war, that he had just mixed poison in the prescription which George was to take to a young child. As for the two pilots, here were two individuals separated by two continents and two different sets of ideals that came together to share a moment in time which impacted both of their lives and the lives associated with them. Luck? I don't think so. God's plan? Absolutely. Have you had an impact on someone's life? I'm sure you have somewhere along the line. You have comforted a friend or family member, provided assistance for an individual, donated your time or finances for a cause that may be dear to you. The author states, quote, in God's vast universe, we matter. Our actions change the actions of others, and that when we are not around, we are missed, end quote. All of your contributions of time, talents, and finances would not have been done had you not been here to do them. In essence, we do matter. Tennis legend Arthur Ashe once said, you make a living by what you earn, but you make a life by what you give. So this Christmas season, when you sit down to view It's a Wonderful Life, watch it with a different perspective, a Christian perspective. Embrace George and Mary and Clarence and all the other characters. Reflect on how God has blessed you and how you have been blessed by others. Clarence the angel says, no man is a failure who has friends. Everyone here in this congregation is a story of success, and we can all claim 
with boldness and certainty that yes, it is a wonderful life. Therefore, cherish it, value it, protect it, but most importantly, share it. Let us pray. As we leave your house today, Lord, allow us to experience the joy of serving you in whatever way you desire of us. Grant us the wisdom of Solomon, the tenacity of Paul, and the gentleness of Jesus as we travel the paths of this life